Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Deborah Pollock Milgate. I'm a partner in the intellectual property department of uh, Barnes and Thornburg. Um, it's really nice to see everybody today. I really enjoy being in this room because it's actually a pretty nice intimate environment to have everyone. So welcome to this month's um, Scottish extravaganza, um, the Life Sciences Lifeline. Um, it's great to see so many of you in person and great to have everyone online as well. I know you have a special treat for you today, so I am not going to waste any more time up here. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to pass it over to um, Kristen Jones. Um, we're so lucky to have you do this, as always. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the to the conversation. Thank you for making the distance, making the trip to join us today, everybody. Great. Thank you, Deborah. Yes, you're very welcome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to everyone here in the room and to all the folks joining us online. I think we've got about a 50-50 split today, so um, not bad. Uh, uh, we are super excited, as Deborah mentioned. This is May is Scotland Extravaganza Month here uh, at the Indiana Health Industry Forum, and uh, we are celebrating a multi-year partnership with our sister organization from Scotland. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But we are also very fortunate that we have two of the companies we're working with this month. We have people kind of cycling in, in and out all month, but we have two of them live and in person today. And we're going to hear a little bit more about what they're working on uh, and what interests them about Indiana and how we might be able to connect with them. Before we get started, just a reminder that uh, if you're here in the room, you have some white note cards. If you have questions at any point, just write it out on that and um, uh, someone will be around to collect it and deliver it up here. Uh, if you are joining us online, uh, if you can put them into the chat function, um, that would be great. And again, they'll they'll write them down and bring them on in and we'll we'll try and get any of those answered as we go. Uh, let's see if we can flip us through a couple of slides. Uh, again, I'm Kristen Jones, President and CEO of the Indiana Health Industry Forum. We're the Life Sciences Trade Association here, and you can learn more about us online at ihif.org. Uh, we've got a handful of new members, which I think are the same members we had up last month, but we're, we're delighted to have these new folks with us. And uh, our Biofutures magazine is also now available if you've uh, uh, not picked up a copy of that. Uh, you're available online. You can get it off of our website. Um, we also have hard copies that are available here if you haven't picked one up yet. Uh, so just to kind of get things started, I pulled a couple of great pictures out from the archives. <laughs> Uh, uh, we have uh, we actually signed a memorandum of agreement in 2017. Oh, I should introduce everybody. So uh, on my left here, uh, Scott Johnson, he is the president of the Scottish Life Sciences Association. So he is my counterpart at our sister organization in Scotland. Also joining us today, we have Kirsten Lord with Physiomedics and Nate Gerke with Pneumowave. And we'll hear more about uh, both of those companies as we go. But Scott's going to kick us off a little bit by by recollecting we'll go way back in the distant past and see uh what it was about indiana that first uh how we first got connected might be a good way to recount that i told my story side of the story a lot but let, let's hear your side of the story great well it's lovely to be here and thank you very much for uh, the invitation I just love love being here it's my second trip this year so um what got us started was one of our members bumped into Kyle um, from Kentucky. Our counterpart in Kentucky. And um, they said, well, you know what, Scotland is about 6 million people. You know, it's not a life sciences community. It spans digital health, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, diagnostics. And we have a pretty big CRO uh, uh, footprint in Scotland. Um, and that kind of looks like what you've got here. But the difference is you really know how to do it. So the output for um, Indiana for life sciences is the same as the entire output of the UK. So it's like 10 times more than Scotland, but you've just got 6 million people as well. So you kind of think, huh, that's quite interesting. So, you know, from my point of view, it's like, well, how do you do it? Um, because we obviously would like to grow our life sciences businesses, but we'd also like to find out why, as you know, one of the sort of key players in life sciences historically, having invented all kinds of stuff from penicillin through to the uh, MRI scanner and these things, why are we not as big as you guys? And, and that's the kind of learning piece. 
um, I'll share with you the reason why, because we know want, now. But, you want uh, to flip through to, to whatever? Um, so, uh, in 2011, um, uh, a group of us in Scotland, um, running businesses, um, thought that you know, it would re be really good if we could have an IHIF type um, uh, paid body of which we could you know, influence uh, government in terms of learn from people that know what they've been doing and how to grow their industry. Uh, and then we could tell the government, say, these are some of the things you have to do. Um, so we thought if we had our own trade body, we could influence government, which um, uh, I don't know if many of you know much about Scotland, but um, we know the first minister pretty well. She was the health minister when we set up. Actually, she uh, launched the <coughs> Sciences uh, Association with us because she was quite intrigued as to why Scotland isn't doing as well as it kind of should in the world stage. So we to do that, and then it's just um, to help our businesses grow. Um, and uh, again, that's the other reason we're here so much is, you know, the US market is 40% of the world's healthcare market. So not only uh, are you going to be smack bang in the middle of that if you come to Indiana, but you're going to have a lot friendlier welcome than <coughs> you go to Boston or New York or uh, California. So really, that's all it was, was really help each other, uh, tell each other what to do, uh, where to go. Um, uh, and what we did want to do was we wanted to run it ourselves. We wanted to feel like we run the trade body. So we set up uh, special interest groups. So we started with, with four, um, finance, <coughs> business development, um, regulatory, and HR. So we thought that that will probably about cover it. And um, we're now up to 20 because if a member wants a special interest group, they can have one. And we will send an invite out to that group to all the membership. And if nobody comes along, well, that will be a short life working group. <laughs> uh, but we've grown to 20 and these are all meeting uh, whenever they need and they set the agenda. And then what we then do is we take the output of those meetings and generally, we'll invite some people that we need. If it's finance, we'll invite some of the capitalists in. But if it's government, we'll get the uh, the people from government to come in and listen from to, to the people that are actually at the conference. So we've got about 130 members. Uh, our target membership is anybody who wants to grow their company in Scotland. That's it. Uh, but we have 12 investor members, which was quite interesting. We never set it up to have investors. But in Scotland, we've got a very um, advanced angel network, which is one of the differences between here and Scotland. Um, so we can get things started, we can get things going, but we don't have that sort of economic output that you guys have got. But it's interesting, the investors are there to meet some of the early innovative companies and find out what they're doing. Get in early, as they say, in the um, stock market. Um, we're fully funded by member subscriptions, so we only have one metric, and that's a happy member. And we judge that by sending them an invoice every year. And if we have 130 members the next year, then we're doing a good job. If we don't, it's either going to be more or less, and we'll, we'll operate to suit. Uh, and we have a very special relationship with the NHS Scotland, and I'm not going to go on too much about NHS Scotland other than they're not very good at buying innovative products. That is really my point as to why we don't have a life sciences community the size of yours, because we don't have a healthcare provider that buys our products, which is why we're here. So I'm just, I'm not going to go into all of these, but these are groups, regulation, call the business, directors, uh, HR, innovation, that last meeting we had three weeks ago went on to two o'clock in the morning with lots of alcohol involved. <laughs> um, finance, again, we've got a meeting coming up with, um, it's been hosted by Bailey Gifford. I don't know if anybody has heard of Bailey Gifford. He has, but they've got about 600 billion under management just along the road from our office in Edinburgh. 
So they were an early investor in things like um, Amazon, Tesla, Alibaba, but they have a low profile, but we have them on our doorstep with a lot of money. It's like, well, why don't you give us a bit more? I'm like, well, you've got to sell products. Uh, digital health, Kristen's here to talk a little bit about that. Diagnostics, medical devices, medicines, cell therapy, um, and the environment's one of our new ones. Uh, manufacturing, precision medicine. Wisdom is our mentoring group for, for, for women in life sciences. So it's uh, where some of our successful women will share their stories with new, um, uh, new companies. Uh, Japan, um, so the USA, we don't have a USA group because that's really our business development group. That whole group is just focused on the US. And China, because we have no idea, but we want to find out. Uh, so these are just some of the things that we engage with government on, obviously with the NHS um, and uh, with uh, Brexit. So I don't know if many of you have heard of Brexit and how good that is. And, you know, my morning was tied up today with how we're going to walk away from the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol, and that could just be a bit of a mess. But again, we've been asked for feedback on that throughout. We sit on the five MHRA committees, so um, the uh, regulator, um, uh, and uh, we obviously work very closely on the COVID-19 response in the UK. <coughs> So these are some of the companies that are not here. Do you want me to come back to this later? How about we come back to those after we talk through everybody else? Yeah, I think that would be. Do you want good. to do uh, Benelux first? So yeah, so I, I mentioned that we were a group of companies when we set up the SLA. So my uh, uh, main role is, is is growing companies. I'm not going to my background, but um, at the moment and very kind of pertinent to why I'm here today is um, uh, a company called Benny Knox which uh, this is our product. We launched it in Europe um, in 2017, but we're just looking to launch in the States and it won't look like that. Uh, but what we've found uh, is uh, the great manufacturing farmers. So I um, can't tell you who they are, but they're not far away from where we're sitting today. Great distribution partners. Um, and then all the ancillaries things that go around with that. So um, that's what we're doing with Benny Knox. It's company formed 2014. Uh, I'm an inventor, a, a scientist and myself. Uh, we got seed investment into that. Uh, we built the intellectual property and, and the data around uh, that uh, initial invention. Uh, we got patents granted and uh, we licensed it to Stada, a German pharma company in there in 2016. It's an over-the-counter product, so we were talking about Nestle and nutrition. So it's a medical food stuff, which saved us having to uh, go down the ID route and uh, have it as a drug. Um, and uh, we're just looking to launch this, fingers crossed, this year in Indiana. Uh, Indiana is a perfect place for this. We've got distribution set up. We just need to get it made and find out what we're going to call it. We might change the name. So. You want to write that? Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned on that. So that's pretty much me. But uh, yeah, here all month. <laughs> <laughs> By the meal, as we like to say. So yeah. I, I think one of the things that has really made our partnership so successful, and we we signed our MOU back in 2017. So this is five year anniversary. Happy anniversary! Yeah, happy or, anniversary! China or, or <laughs> linen or yeah. candles? I don't know. Um, but uh, we've been we've been talking about it for a couple of years before that, so it actually goes much further back. I really, one of the, the parts we can't stress enough is the alignment between the markets. You know, it, six million people, they look um, uh, condition-wise, uh, the things they are grappling with on the, the metabolic disease side, uh, they just look a lot like us. And uh, our organizations look quite similar. We we're just a hair larger, um, but, uh, uh, again, it's a similar mix of pharma and device and IT and all the things you need to really build out a, a full-fledged cluster. Um, what we have here, though, as Scott and Benanox have, have, have shown, is the, uh, the manufacturing expertise and the ability to do the distribution and get products to market quickly and a market that is receptive to those types of products. And that's, that's really kind of what, what the big challenge is 
in Scotland is yeah. is getting folks to invest in what's invented from there. So so what we have developed is a is a great partnership where we connect the folks who come over here with folks in our membership, with folks across the state in the industry, and we're necessary beyond that. But um, uh, happy to make those connections. You can do pretty much all of the things you need to do to develop a drug or device here in the state of Indiana. So uh, where we can be an easier and more welcoming test market for them. You know, you may not end up here, but if you can do some introductions and learn a little bit about the market uh, and how it operates, uh, this is this is an easy way to do it. And and I'll tell you, it is a lot different dealing with hospitals here in the U.S. than it is dealing with the NHS. So that might be a <laughs> that might be a good entree point. Um, I would love to introduce uh, Kirsten Lord. Kirsten is with Physiomedics. They're one of their new company to us this year. We've over the years worked with I don't know twenty some odd Scottish companies that have come through, and and all of them have had uh, slightly different needs, but. Um, we're really excited to have her with us for the whole week this week, and um, she can tell you a little bit more about physiomedics. I keep seeing physio wizard on the, the screen up there, but um, about what they have and how it works. So, Kirsten, if you would like to give it a shot, go ahead. Sure. Hi, I'm Kirsten Lord. I'm the founder and chief clinical officer for physiomedics, and today I'm going to tell you a bit more about the story of physio wizard. Um, First of all, I have an Australian accent. I I actually completed my degree in Australia, finished it in 1989, and then moved to Scotland and opened my first clinic in 1991. And when treating patients, um, what I could see was that technology was becoming a bigger and more important part of, of patients' assessments. And they would assess themselves online and come in with screeds of notes saying, I think I've got this, or I think I've got that. And sometimes they were right. And quite often they'd looked at the worst case scenario and had developed mental health issues. Alongside of that, a lot of people had actually developed chronic conditions, mental health issues and chronic conditions go together. And I thought there has to be something that makes it easier for patients to connect with information and understand their condition better so that they could self-manage it. Um, and that is, of course, advantageous for the companies that are actually looking after those, those patients. So um, we developed the Physio Wizard, and it took a long time. I did it with a lot of the, the clinicians I had working for me. At the time, I had clinics in both Edinburgh and Glasgow, and uh, we would have major brainstorming groups and come up with pathways of care, and it took a long time just to develop the first area of the body which was the lower back we then clinically trialed that and then we've extended that into 108 different assessments throughout the body so it is the world's first clinically validated um, muscle and joint self-assessment that is given to a patient for them to a patient or an employee because we work in wellness to complete online and it can actually replace that early management that a primary care doctor or physical therapist does that first assessment where you actually say this is the this is where that person needs to go or this is what that person needs to do or not do um, so there is no clinician involved it's an automated process and the software matches to the optimal care pathway for that patient and also gives early information and exercises if it's appropriate um, so, as I said, clinically validated, CE marked in, in um, UK and Europe. And um, we've got consistency in assessments, which is different to if you go and see, um, if you see one of four clinicians, they will assess you differently. Um, what you want is to be able to collect the, the same information that is consistent and important, and you're not limited to a six to eight minute assessment with a primary care physician. Um, so it's been designed by medical um, MSK specialists and it's an instant result. So you get exercises advice on what to do next instantly. And of course, there's a huge amount of well formatted data that is collected and summarized at, at the end. Um, next slide. So a little bit more about the team. And this is just these are some of the, the, the members of the executive team. We've got about 15 people in total. Um, we outsource our software to a um, specialist medical company, uh, a, a medical software company. And our CEO is, is experienced in medical devices and software over a long period of time. Our COO, likewise, has got about 20 years of, of technology and scaling up. And 
Rick, um, a, another director in the company, is, has got fingers in pies throughout the wellness industry and insurance industries as well. Um, I'm going to play you just a, a quick kind of summary and hopefully this is going to work. Welcome to Physio Wizard, your online assessment for muscle and joint pain. This assessment will last about 10 to 15 minutes and at the end you'll be provided with recommendation on what to do next as well as personalised information about your symptoms, general guidance on management and exercises where appropriate. If you're a first-time user, please click on register and enter your details into the form, accept the terms and conditions and click register. You'll be sent a confirmation email to verify your account. Please click the link to validate and you'll be redirected back to Physio Wizard to log in. If you've been sent an assessment invite by your healthcare provider, please create your password and click login to start. Once you're logged in, please click start to begin. During your assessment, you'll be asked a series of questions about the body area affected, your symptoms, your previous medical history, and additional details about your current problem and how it's affecting you. If you need to add additional information, there are optional text boxes throughout the assessment. At the end of the assessment, you'll receive your report. Your report summarises the information you have provided to PhysioWizard and then you'll see PhysioWizard's recommendation on what to do next. This section will direct you to the appropriate healthcare service or to self-management. You'll also receive personalised information about your symptoms, including general guidance to manage and alleviate them. At the end of the report, and where appropriate, you're offered some exercises that can help your recovery. We hope this video was useful. We're looking forward to helping you on the road to recovery. Okay. Well, I'll summarise a little bit about that. <laughs> um, so, as I said, we're clinically validated. Um, there's no clinician required to come up with the, the output, which is different to anything else that we have found worldwide. Um, there are nine recommended pathways, so it goes from emergency room to self-management. And the way we do this is that, that a lot of the questions have triggers that will take you to various pathways. We have an, a hierarchy of outcomes and you will always go to the, the most, um, the highest level of outcome to take you to that, that, that pathway accurately. We've got a lot, of, a lot of clinical evidence behind this. We've done clinical trials. Our first clinical trial in 2015 gave us the 93% validation between a physical therapist and the outcome of the assessment. And those that, the 7% that were not actually exact went to a high level of care. So safety is paramount in, in being able to offer something that is automated that does not include a clinician to, to make decisions. Um, although we don't know whether that's actually a good thing in America yet, <laughs> uh, we may need to just make sure that there's a clinician to check that at the end of the pathway of care here. Um, patient management, that's talking about that hierarchy of triggers. We also have automated um, nudges as well. So if you're telling someone go, to go to emergency department, we'll not only give you a, a, an assessment that you can take and show to the, the, the physicians at the emergency department, but we will actually just nudge you 24 hours later and just say, have you done this? Um, or earlier, that's, that's all configurable for the, the client. Um, we have automated reports for clinicians. So um, instead of actually a cl a clinicians writing out all the, the notes, it's, it's there, it's created by the, the patient in their own words as well. Um, and that's, there's a real advantage to that because there's a, there's, there are a lot of studies showing that the difference between what actually happens in a, in a consultation is not always reflected in the notes as well as themselves. There can be up to a 90 percent discrepancy in, in that actual and the recording. Um, and in terms of the patients, they end up with an assessment that they can share with, with any kind of medical um, a practitioner as well, so that they're not telling their story over and over, over again. And, and certainly in the UK, you get a lot of people going around and around the healthcare system, seeing the same types of people telling their story over and over again. Um, it's, there, of course, there are a lot of data insights from that well-constructed data and, and ways of getting into the back end to, to analyse that as well. 
regulations and compliance are incredibly important. We're talking about patient data. So in terms of patient data, we need to know that everything is secure. We've got two-part authentication. We've penetration tested it regularly. Um, and we're actually in the process of, of opening it in India and Poland at the moment. Um, we're already in Ireland, but that was a much easier kind of um, jump but getting into other countries, um, the US hopefully being the next one is um, is more challenging in terms of the, the amount of documentation we need to have behind us to support that. Um, these are the sectors that we are already in, in the UK. Um, workers' compensation is occupational health in the UK. So um, there is quite a lot to explore and learn about the, the different sectors here. And I'm going to say, I'll tell you later on what, what my ask is from you guys and if you know people that, that can actually help with this. Um, we have, we are actually already supplying to corporates in the employee, employee wellbeing and benefit sector. And we have, um, we're actually providing services to the biggest healthcare, uh, private healthcare um, company, provider company in the UK and they have hospitals. We also provide to clinics as well, and there are different value propositions for each of these sectors. And if you're looking at the, the US market, the incidence of MSK is absolutely enormous. So in 2015, um, there was a study showing that 50.1% of Americans suffered from an MSK condition or reported an MSK condition that year. And Hinge Health, I think that was a couple of years ago, came up with a prediction that it was 600 million or oh, billion pounds worth of, of cost. And that's just in healthcare costs and loss of productivity for employees that, that may be absent or are experiencing presenteeism. And if you don't, if you're not clear on the what presenteeism, presenteeism is, it's basically being present at work when you're not actually doing that much work because you're in pain, you can't focus, you can't concentrate, you're getting up constantly. And, um, and of course, people that have pain are not able to function in the same way as some, someone who's pain-free. The incidence of MSK is increasing rapidly. And last year, there were seven, seven million orthopedic surgeries in the US. But you can see a growth of 44% since 2010. So this is a major cost to both employers and healthcare providers. Um, Post-COVID works, things are still not working well in the UK, certainly. And that's, again, I would like to find out more about what's happening in, in hospitals over here, but there are there fewer operations being able to, to take place because of all the, the processes because of COVID. And if we're looking at COVID, um, <coughs> 37.7% were reported to be work-related um, compared to 1.4% So it's a in our lifestyle where people are, are less active, they're not going outside of the house, There's, they're putting on weight, they actually even call it the COVID kilo, and, um, and they're just being less active. Less activity leads to to numerous issues with your your muscle function so yeah and 89 percent of those versus, versus arthritis which is one of the biggest arthritis cha charities in the uk so the 89 percent of people are not telling their employer so their employer has no idea that that they have an a, a, an ill workforce effectively and therefore how do they actually manage that how do they get people more active This is just a, um, a selection of benefits 24-7 online and 20% of people complete this out of, outside of working hours. So its convenience factor is enormous. Um, we've gone through a lot of these before, but just picking out a couple, um, GDPR compliant, which is similar to HIPAA, but we realise that we need to understand what the HIPAA regulations um, imply for us. And, um, and it fits into pathways of care for various organisations. So just going on to that, it can be a standalone system. Most people, that most organisations, for instance, the bank that we're working with would want wraparound care where 
we're actually leading people to online GP services or employment or um, private healthcare services or with a, a full-on integration that is usually required by healthcare providers um, such as insurance companies. <coughs> and the focus of my trip is um, really looking at what are the pain points, what are the differences between the UK and here, and which sectors would our product fit into best? Um, and how would it fit, how will it fit in? So um, I've just been speaking with Justin and his organisation this morning on the, the gap analysis of our regulatory side. But, and of course, if there are any funding opportunities here, I'd be interested to speak to, to people that know about those. But if anyone actually has any, um, any relationships that, that they think may be helpful in terms of exploring these sectors, wellness, workers' compensation, insurance or hospital clinics, please get in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I know just from having met you uh, the, the last couple of months that we've been talking leading up to this visit, I, I am working actively on my posture. <laughs> Even as you're talking, I'm trying to sit up straighter and be a little less uh, contorted in my work, but I, I fit that COVID description. What would, you say, um, what would you say so far has been maybe the most surprising thing you've learned about the U.S. that you, you weren't expecting so far? That's a really interesting question. I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Actually, it's what's been so refreshing is to hear the, the negative, negatives as well as the positives. You know, what what is this healthcare system like? I'm um, coming from Australia. I actually see a lot more similarities between Australia and America yep. compared to the UK, and it's really refreshing to hear that people are not left on waiting lists for such a long time because the impact that has on people's health in the UK is absolutely enormous. So, yes, I, I like to find out about the differences and, and the differences between different healthcare organisations because it's, it's fun to sort of see how, how we could actually fit. I think one of the things, that in, in for most many of the folks in your, your shoes, it, the, the translation between how you work with a group like the NHS that is while it has individual pockets, is still fairly coordinated amongst those pieces um, to such a decentralized system as we have here. And we were we were talking earlier even about the um, how when you're dealing with folks who deal with orthopedic or musculoskeletal conditions, uh, that that model is even becoming more decentralized as more of those are independent clinics these days or are for-profit organizations or uh, physician controlled groups and and just how do you make a plan then to network or contact or work within those different segments of it. So it, it makes it um, yeah several layers more complicated I think for folks and, and one of the areas where we frequently have a challenge is finding a good healthcare delivery connection um, to help bridge that gap and give people insight into just how the care works. So um, if anyone again if anyone has any ideas or suggestions um, we would be happy to please reach out to um, I have, or um, we'll have Kirsten's uh, information as well available. So, thank, thank you. you. And I would say, um, going on from what Scott has said, and, and we have knocked our head against a brick wall for years with the NHS, and the positivity that you hear over here is just wonderful. <laughs> it's, it's not a no we can't afford it because we're actually spending money on things that we can justify that somehow they can justify, but they're not making any impact. And they don't, they're not predictive in, in the way that they do anything. So they will actually, they will just clean up the mess rather than actually addressing something right at the beginning to save costs, benefit the patient and make it easier on the clinicians. And it's, it's perplexing why, why, we're actually facing these kind of challenges back in the UK. Well, that's why you're here. So we're here. Well, <laughs> you know what? And we're happy to have you. You're not going to change the NHS. <laughs> we are all for right. Well, I, last but certainly not least, um, we have uh, Nate Perky with uh, Numo Wave. Sorry. Wave. And I'm the Vice President of Business Development, uh, spearheading the US operations um, as well as capitalizing on. Uh, global value creating initiatives. Um, we're creating digital therapeutics 
uh, in mental health and substance use disorders, really to help patients manage their uh, health and live their lives better. Uh, we've got 10 active clinical trials uh, in academic organizations, as well as some NHS funded uh, trials. We've got the FDA breakthrough uh, medical device uh, designation, and we're seeking a de novo here in the coming uh, next couple of years uh, here in the U.S., as well as seeking CE markings. Um, you know, our team's built of uh, scientific folks, as well as uh, digital health care uh, people like myself who have the experience rolling out uh, digital health products here in the U.S. Uh, through uh, not only acute care, but also remote care settings. And so the mental health and substance use, it's a very large and growing problem uh, here, not only in the U.S., but also in the U.K. Uh, the pandemic has began to uh, kind of accelerate uh, some of these problems. And, you know, it's a quite vulnerable population, um, you know, so, uh, you know, we're seeking to kind of fill treatment gaps um, as well as, you know, implement uh, more easy uh, you know, solutions that are dedicated to end to end management services around this uh, quite vulnerable population. And so, what we are is um, a digital therapeutic platform as well as real time monitoring. We've got uh, digital assessments that capture physiological data, and we're able to create uh, solutions around predictive and prescriptive capabilities focused on improving uh, treatment for folks who are suffering from substance use disorders and mental health illnesses. Um, you know, our solutions <clears throat> are primarily focused on being able to help uh, physicians connect with patients remotely um, as the pandemic has kind of accelerated that touch point for being able to provide remote care and drive value-based outcomes. And as I mentioned, we've got a diverse pipeline of clinical trials, some that are in its earlier stages. But um, again, you know, we're focused on substance use biomarkers, um, as well as, um, you know, being able to capture uh, mental health uh, illnesses in this population. So, um, you know, we are in the early stages of a couple of these, and some of them are later, later stages, but we've been able to extract uh, meaningful and accurate data, and we're going to leverage this data in order to produce, uh, you know, predictive and prescriptive capabilities around uh, substance use disorders in order to prevent, um, you know, adverse effects before they occur. And, you know, we're going to leverage the insights from here to then develop novel treatment solutions, whether they're digital therapeutic or uh, biological uh, drugs focused on improving outcomes at lower costs. And so right now we're in the process of establishing uh, collaboration agreements with biopharmaceutical companies, particularly focused in the digital therapeutic space, um, as well as those that have traditional pharmaceutical products. Um, you know, and so that's currently our focus as we uh, go through clinical trials and capture accurate and precise data and are able to drive uh, new development of products that are helping these patients in these vulnerable populations. So here's our team again, you know, uh, my focus is, uh, you know, on the business development and corporate development side and um, our folks are in Scotland. I'm our only U.S. Uh, base folks, and we're looking to build out the U.S. operations here and capitalize on opportunities in this space to, you know, help this vulnerable population uh, that is continuing to grow as, uh, you know, mental health and substance use disorders uh, increase. So, um, you know, I, I think the reason why we came here is to connect with folks in Indiana, given it's kind of a, a you know, a problem that's, you know, hit so close to home here. And again, you know, we look forward to bringing our Scotland-based uh, crew and expanding it here into the U.S. and being able to, you know, roll our solutions that were initially developed, uh, you know, for folks within, you know, kind of the, the U.K. and being able to apply those solutions here into the U.S. I, you know, one of the things when we, as we've been working with this, one, this is certainly an example of one of those shared um, shared problems that we have or shared conditions that we have. And yeah, as you mentioned, India is no stranger to opioid overdose. 
uh, conditions and, and concerns. And this is a, a great product that we think we can we can bring in, um, connect with folks who can help them, provide them with some of the data that they're going to need. Nate, what would you say, uh, sort of on the regulatory front, is what is your what is your biggest challenge in that case? Is would you say here for just specifically in the U.S. or over the there? US. Yeah, again, it's it's being able to. Uh, one, fund the clinical trials and, again, design them in a way that we're capturing, you know, not only the, you know, accurate clinical data, but also be able to demonstrate kind of the cost savings so that when we engage with uh, both private and public payers that, uh, you know, we're able to show the significant cost savings and the value contribution and proposition of our products. Um, so I, I would say that's probably the, the largest one. And then secondly, as always, price. Um, just due to the economic difference between, uh, you know, not only the United Kingdom but but here in the U.S. And and again, it's it's a fairly typical uh, scenario for what we're dealing with with these companies. You know, I, I frequently get asked, well, you know, are they coming and they're setting up a manufacturing plant and going from there? It's, no, this is this is not the business model that you need. Um, there's a lot of work that has to go in before you get to that point, and if ever, um, and uh, so much of it is understanding what your regulatory pathway looks like and how it differs from the information you've collected, finding ways to collect the information you need here to. To, to make a case for for the U.S. regulatory uh, authorities, and uh, and then figuring out your pathway forward at, as you go along with all of that. So it, it's really a much more complicated process than people tend to think it is, and um, uh, but one that we're quite able to help people through, and delighted to have everybody here. So uh, Scott, I, you had a slide with a couple other other folks on it. Oh, I think we're going to have to go way 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 back. back. Um, see if we can get to that and talk through some of the other companies that we're working with just to give everybody an idea uh, of what we have. Again, if you have questions, you have uh, note cards there uh, in front of you, or if you're watching online and would like to submit a question or ask a question or raise your hand and say you have you have somebody you'd like somebody to talk to, let us know. And I also uh, think this room picks up everybody from just about anywhere. So we, so we can ask out loud in here? and ask out loud. Yes. Fantastic. Just occurred to me. Good. So, that makes it easy. So these are, um, uh, we had all these guys uh, kind of signed up but for various reasons. Now, you have to understand in Scotland, we're still having virtual meetings. So we're kind of not as far advanced. We are still in the meetings. process of coming back together. So so hence, hence so split it's, between online and, and there. So. It's still a bit of a struggle. We still have to get tested to come here and stuff. So there's, it's still not as smooth as it used to be. So we had a number of companies that were going to come, but um, passports was one of the issues and getting their passport renewed. And just all the, remember when we used to travel two years ago, you would just like sort that out. And then all of a sudden, like, we're going to travel, oh, my passport's out. So we had a little bit of issue over, you know, some of these guys. But if I just go through and know, uh, order interest resource solutions. Well, he's going to be out tomorrow, so he almost made the cut, um, <laughs> and uh, or he made the cut and just got a, a buy-in. So, um, so Entrust Resource, so this is a um, a, a people uh, company, and one of the big issues that we share with you guys is skill shortages. So we have a big skill shortages in Scotland, particularly around regulatory and quality individuals. We just can't get them. Very difficult and. The universities just, we have a lot of universities, but they don't train, they can't train. They can give you a broad kind of, you know, here's ISO 1345 or here's uh, what the X stands for in GXP, but much more than that, it's about it. Um, and then we have our companies that are all, well, we need these people, they need to have experience. And it's like, well, you need to do that yourself and you've got to train them yourself because the university is not going to do it do it yourself and it's like we don't have the time because we've got to get this done yesterday and we can't do that so Austin's coming out tomorrow and we're going to have some meetings with similar companies like Entrust to see if we can piece this together through the membership and can we find some mechanism so one of our groups is in the um, qualified persons group so the people that sign off your your drugs uh, batches and they're very good at sharing each other out. So when they get a trainee coming in to the QP group, they'll be like, now you have to go and what, 
you know, not work in that company, but go and spend some time with that company and find out what they do. And then go and and that just makes the whole world a difference because they've got a broader experience and expertise. So when it comes to uh, batch testing and release, they can do that. So we're trying to broaden that up, meet some of the companies here and see how we can do that. We're also looking at, well, if you've got good things happening here, could we send people over here or do you want to send people over to Scotland? So again, we're dealing with the embassy on that to say, well, if we need some kind of special visa or allow that to happen, we could do that. So that's, I'm going to be here all day. Um, so uh, IIG, Intuitive Investments Group, they're a, an investment, they're a fund um, out of Scotland, <laughs> raised um, some money recently, but they're really keen. Um, so for example, they're invested in uh, Nate's company, Pneumowave. Uh, but they're really keen of, well, there's so much happening here in the States. Is there some way we can match up some of the funding? And we've had discussions on this around specific companies, but is there something we can do on a funds basis to say, well, we can raise some money. Again, we've got early stage investment groups and angels in, in, in Scotland. Um, you guys have got access to bigger pots of cash. We've got access to really big pots of cash. And is there somewhere really that we can all work together to say, well, your market's going to be the US, so let's see how we can just be that bridge and get the early stage stuff and move it across. So that's, um, uh, uh, Rob was supposed to be on that one. So uh, San and Daff is a uh, uh, decontamination company. So they'll come in and if you've got a problem or you just need your regular um, uh, hydrogen peroxide um, fog, fogging or decontamination for your site, they can come in and do that. But there are lots of opportunities in terms of just specific device sterilization that they've got expertise in the whole hydrogen peroxide piece. And they also have a really interesting piece of kit, which is, um, uh, it's, I would just say it's really special, but it, it means that you know, if I wanted to do the underside of that table, well, it's a bit of wood there, but if that bit of wood wasn't there, you could spray that and it would go under and it would stick. So you, you don't have to, so if you have a tennis ball, you can just do that and it'll just, it's really kind of cool. So it, it gets 75% more of what you want to decontaminate. So that's San and uh, they would definitely be here next time. Uh, Lumira DX, I don't know if anybody's heard, but you know it's mostly in Scotland. They do all their uh, manufacturing in Scotland, uh, and it's a diagnostics company. So they um, uh, they do things like uh, INR testing for your, you know, just how thick is or thin is your blood to D-dimer to, you know, something's gone on, something's happened. We need to find out what that was. To CRP, so anybody a big fan of CRP testing, C-reactive protein as I am, then they have that test. But, you know, from a standing start, uh, not that many years ago, um, they turned over $450 million last year because they managed to bring out a COVID-19 test, which was sold in all the pharmacies. So it's a really neat piece of kit. Google it and, you know, you, you can get your test done. They're looking at having about 30 tests on that. And I'm looking at having one in my house. So, um, Green Cross Medical, uh, uh, again, they've been here before, but it's about venous access and uh, where you can't get blood out, despite the fact, you know, just know myself are pretty easy to get blood out of. Uh, a lot of people are, and that device helps them to do that. So we're trying to roll that out into the US. And again, through uh, IHIF, we've found the perfect partners. Uh, we just have managed to get the company over here at this point. Um, <laughs> Some, somebody, and COVID does. somebody got COVID, somebody got COVID at the weekend. So um, ProMedim, um, they, they're normally out with us. Um, they, so they do uh, computer system validation. So this is just something that's really beginning to hurt us all in terms of it's becoming a bigger piece of what we have to do. Uh, and they're developing something in the, in, on the software side that can kind of help uh, automate that. Not fully, but it's going to help cut out some of the, the legwork. And Selectus, again, it's up in your place. We saw it um, uh, and, you know, already working with Med Institute 
uh, and, and just again getting them into the US market, but also that's that manufacturing piece because they couldn't get the, the, the device itself is uh, uh, it's a bioreactor, but it's a really cool one because it blows bubbles through it and um, uh, you, you'll just get better uh, production rates through it. Um, but they had problems uh, getting the bags in the UK. And guess what? You've got somebody here in Indiana that does it, and that's fine. And that's a continuing story. There's another company, 30 Technology. You know, they, they do nitrous oxide patches for, for wound healing, and they just couldn't get the manufacturing done in, in the UK. Indiana, they're down the street. This is just a recurring story of, ah, you know, we put the money in, we develop the product, go to manufacture, we can't do it. We don't have that capability. Well, guess what? If you come to Indiana, it's here, and you know um, we know where they are. Um, and it's just about expanding that network. So all the SLA members are members of IHIF, and all IHIF members are members of SLA. So when you're in Scotland, you have access to the offices, which has access to our drinks cabinet. So, uh, <laughs> and we also have uh, access to golf courses. So. Yeah. Um, uh, we can do whatever you think Scottish people can do, which is drinking and playing golf. <laughs> help that along the way. So, um, did I miss anybody here? No, I think I think you covered most of the ones that we're we're really active with right now. Is is most of the folks on the screen? But um, again, going back to what he said, it, it's really our ability to help meet their need, uh, fulfill that quickly, and um, uh, help help innovative products with, with good background and good science behind them, just find the markets they were meant to serve. So we're happy to happy to help with that. Uh, as Scott mentioned, I, you know, our, our MOU is, is, is everybody's one big happy family. So if you're a part of IHIF, you are part of SLA and vice versa, and uh, you'll get the same kind of treatment uh, that we give our own members. So if you, if you like what you've seen here, you're all accessible to you. So, um, uh, Scott also mentioned um, uh, some of the back and forth that we do. So generally in the spring, they come over uh, here, generally May. It uh, works well with the race and a couple other things going on around the state of Indiana this time of year. Uh, we generally go over there in the fall for his annual meeting, which is an excellent chance just to network with his members, uh, understand a little bit more about what's happening in the marketplace. You get a lot of good of clinicians yeah. Um, that do come to your meeting. So uh, again, from that understanding, just kind of from a first person interactive perspective, uh, it's a great way to meet those folks and hear what their challenges are and concerns are and what they're working on. The NHS is a great place to develop products. So they are very easy to work with from, from the product development, get some data, um, help fund that part of it to prove your concept. Um, but then where you have to go with it after that is, is generally someplace else. So um, again, if you're looking early stages of development, it's another option for you and something that's, that's available as well. So um, any any questions from the audience or from folks online? Oh, yeah. please, Howard. Dave, where you are, where you come Yeah, if you could say your name and uh, oh. just speak up so they can, oh, the, the green light can hear you. No, I have a question, you know, in, in Europe, the medical practice is much more regulated and more funded by the government. Here in the United States, there's more private and particularly as you get into Medicare, like I'm now on Medicare, and I get all these special, like the Fitbit free and things like which are diagnostic devices. But I just wonder, it seems like our market would be stronger and better for you to and to be successful than say over in Europe, because you could probably talk insurance companies into, you know, using your devices, never more so than over in Europe. And the other question I have pretty quickly is, as far as approval in the U.S., it seems like it may be really more difficult to approve your clinical trials here than in Europe. And what would be the rule of approval? Would it be a 510K or would it just be a... Yeah, so over here it's 510K or... or, or um, it's just a bit of a mess now in Europe. Um, so it used to be, as you said, Go to Europe first, and then come back to the US. Um, it's just go to the US um, because what's happened in Europe is we've moved up to um, MDR, so now it's a regulation. IBDR is a regulation, so what more you have to do to get your product regulated in Europe? And 
we subcontract out the actual that regulatory piece of the inspections. So that goes to, if you're in Europe, that's a notified body. If you're in the UK, it's an approved body because of Brexit. It's just so complicated, it's not worth it because um, the number of notified bodies have gone down from about 80 to about less than 20. So, yeah. <laughs> so when you then put that on to approved bodies, we've got four in the UK that can actually get your product. So it just makes it so much more difficult. These notify bodies, the reason we've got so little is in the old days, uh, you could be inspected by somebody who didn't really know much about your product. Now that inspector has to have worked in that industry. So I actually have to have worked in it before they can inspect you. So unless you're using an old product and you're getting that inspected by the same inspector, the minute this thing called digital health comes in and it's like, well, we don't have any inspectors that have ever worked in the software industry, you know, for a standalone product. So, you know, it's just no go. So BSI, who many of you will have heard of your notify body, um, they're really struggling with this as well. And they have an 18 month lead time on getting you to know. Yeah. Well, that's if it's positive, but mostly it'll be a negative anyway. So it's just it's just not happening at the moment. And Britain with Brexit, don't get me started. It's just a nightmare because we're going to have something different. But actually, if what we're doing now, despite the fact that we said we would stick with IBDD and MDD, we're actually going to go up to pretty much IBDR and um, MDR. And if you look at what is happening at the moment with Northern Ireland, we're making that border more porous. This is why the EU doesn't like it, because it's like, well, wait a minute, we have a back door into the EU here. So actually having that whole approved body, MDD, IVD, D, we're probably better off just sticking with the whole notified body piece, because BSI can still do it, right? So if you could get them, then just do that. And then with that increasingly porous way into Europe, um, it means that we'll get into Europe by the back door. Now, that's not happening today, but that's the direction of travel of the UK government, which is the opposite direction of travel of Europe because they don't make, well, they don't want that to happen. Um, and it's just so complicated. So it used to be difficult to get your well, 510k. Oh yeah, but it's the FDA and it's going to be tricky. And, you know, it's, yeah, we've really managed to overtake you and that and making it really It's crazy. a whole new world out there. <laughs> and Just hence crazy. the need for for some um, cross border regulatory training as well. And that's another reason we're looking we're looking at this program. Eric, did you have a, a comment? We got we've got about I just have and a half. one comment. Forget the CE mark. The sixteen labs in the EU are not taking new customers, are not processing MDR in vitro. The system is broken. So SGS, TUB, the yes. British now in uh, the Netherlands broke. When you're doing your clinical trials, make sure you consult with your CDRH early. Make sure the technical files are in place. Yes, the FDA is a lot different than notified bodies with TV, Norex, and SGS. But I found regular communication with FDA's various centers, CDRH, CBER, CEDAR, Center for Food Safety, those are the places to go. I have actually a retired FDA field investigator as a consultant to me. So we do work with companies on the regulatory side. But the CE mark for medical devices and in vitro devices, it is broken. At least the FDA looks at safety and efficacy. The time spent on getting the technical file right is the critical issue. <coughs> Eric Hunt, U.S. Department of Commerce, <laughs> Indiana District uh, District Office. So. I've dealt with this for 25 years. <laughs> and, uh, 
<laughs> again, we can hook you up. Well, thank you, everybody. We have we've come to the end of our time today. Thank you all for joining us. We will be off uh, July or June and July. We will be at the Bio Convention in San Diego uh, next month, and then uh, July is summer, and we all should enjoy that. Uh, because it's been a long time since we've had nice heat. So um, as, as many of our folks from, from Scotland will, will attest, it's a good thing here. Um, so we hope to see you again sometime in August, uh, and we have a great lineup for the fall. Uh, have a wonderful summer. Uh, thank you all for coming. If you have any questions, again, if you need to reach uh, us or you have any insights for, for something you'd like to do in Scotland, uh, info at ihif.org is the best way to reach us, uh, or just reach out directly. You can you, pretty much find me anywhere. Uh, thank you all. Have a wonderful summer. Okay. Well,